1992 and instantly got involved with the preservation of the petroglyphs. In 1999, I started the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, which was organized for the purpose of trying to record all of the petroglyphs on the Mesa and to educate uh, local people and others, and especially local children, about the petroglyphs and to or work toward their preservation in whatever way we could. We had our 20th anniversary last year, and um, everyone is somewhat surprised that we managed to survive for 20 years and to achieve a lot of work, but we did. We started recording petroglyphs in 2002. When we started, and we were not recording just the Wills Petroglyph Preserve, we um, had a goal of trying to to record every petroglyph on the entire mesa, having no idea at the time what that really meant. When we started, we thought there might be as many as 20,000 images on the mesa. We have now recorded almost 70,000, and um, we still have a whole lot of real estate to cover on this mesa, and so we're quite sure that there will be at least 100,000 when all is said and done and entered into our database. So this entire area was initially recorded in the 1990s at the invitation of Catherine Wells by Helen and Jay Crotty, who ran an archeological field school here. It was re-recorded in the mid 2000s by members of the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, um, uh, especially Janet McKenzie and Candy Bordun and uh, Candy's husband, Lee Bordun. Because of Helen and Jay Crotty's work here in the 1990s, the Archaeological Society of New Mexico's Rock Art Council had data from here, as well as the Galisteo Basin and the Albuquerque area to establish the standards that we record these to today. So these petroglyphs were actually instrumental in our understanding of petroglyphs and pictographs more broadly in New Mexico and are very much the basis on which we classify them both here based on Helen and Jay Crotty's work, but uh, also throughout the state. The petroglyphs do not exist in a vacuum. They are in the place they are for a reason. The number one reason is because at the bottom of the mesa there is a river, the Rio Grande, that um, provides a water, a permanent water source for human life. The Pueblo people came here from areas north of here that did not have permanent water sources. And so they came into this area because of the river and its ability to support life for a long period. So that's an important piece of the um, picture here, as are the mountains, which the, the Mesa faces. The snow, of course, provides the water that gets into the river. It also provided hunting grounds for the people and spiritual um, connections to the to the Pueblo people, to all Native Americans. The natural world is full of spirit. Those, the spirit resides in the mountains and the rivers and the land. So those are very important pieces of the um, context for the petroglyphs and for the lives of the, the Pueblo, Pueblo people and the people who were here before them. There were um, uh, other cultures here before them, notably um, archaic hunters and gatherers who were here for thousands of years.
The first time I came here with a real estate person, we parked right where my house is now. I saw the rock up behind me and I ran up there in about three tenths of a second and saw that the, the whole face of the rock is covered with amazing petroglyphs. And I was just stunned by it, by how big it was, how beautiful the images were. The context for it, which was all these huge boulders and the juniper trees. I turned around and saw the, the trees along the river. which had a lot of snow on them and it was just the most beautiful place and I thought I'm gonna live here. I was already a petroglyph junkie. Um, I'd been running around the deserts of California and Utah and places like that for a long time looking for petroglyphs and to, to discover that you could buy acres and acres of them was just stunning to me. So it wasn't very long before I lived here. So this amazing, amazing rock panel has um, a lot of different images on it. Um, but probably the most important ones have to do with rain. We can see that they're two snake-like creatures that also look like lightning, and they could be both, but they probably, uh, serpents are, are associated with rain. And also, there's a cloud terrace on the rock, a stepped thing that is, can, is in the Pueblo culture, an image of a cloud. And so that tells us this, this rock has to do with making rain happen. Anybody who lives here for very long understands that rain is life. Um, if we don't get rain, nobody can live here. And so it's a particularly important rock um, by where it is and what's on it. Reserve has, um, along with marvelous, marvelous Pueblo images covering Spanish history, it has literally thousands of images created by the archaic period people who um, came into the area perhaps 7,500 years ago and made images from that time clear down to perhaps 1,000, maybe 500 years ago. What distinguishes them is that they are all non-representational. There are a lot of repeated motifs. We have no idea uh, what the meaning might be because they don't resemble anything in the visual world. But this would be kind of typical. Um, lots of lines and a, a pattern of lines, not just random, but um, but not anything that we can really relate to. But they're fascinating. And some of them are carved a half an inch deep, which is the reason we can still see them because they are so old. If they'd been done superficially, they would be gone by now. But they're, they're something very much worthy of study and, and very, very interesting to think about. Few 
population seems on the Wells Petroglyph Preserve. It's not a real common item, but they exist and they tend to be utterly charming. You might say somewhat, sometimes a little exaggerated in terms of the physical properties of the people doing this event here. And I particularly love this one. It's so, it's so charming, this female. We know that she's a female because she has, well, she has female equipment and she also has the hair whirl hairdo that, that um, Pueblo women wore back in the day. And this male character here is quite beautifully drawn and he's obviously very much, very well endowed. So it's, it's not the most realistic view you might find, but, um, but quite charming, I think. We have quite a number of female figures and we have many that are giving birth um, we have others that we know are females because of the, their gender markings. We have one that has a sun-like head. We've actually learned that as far as the experts know it's it's a deity figure and it has both masculine and feminine characteristics and a deity of course doesn't have to be any gender i don't think but it's this one in particular the one that my necklace is very very charming everyone who sees it just loves it i'm sure that on the wells petrol preserve there are at least 50 images of females. Accompanying this couple is an Avanyu, the, the two-horned serpent, who's so important in Pueblo cosmology and, and um, culture, but he's clearly the Avanyu, the water serpent. Common images on the mesa um, is that of the snake or serpent and we find images that are rattlesnakes we know because they have rattles on their tails and just kind of generic snakes but the most exciting category is this mythological creature called Avanyu um, who has horns coming out the side of his head and he's extremely important creature here. And he's found so many different places, almost anywhere that you would associate with water, you'll find him. He's often coming out of the ground because the underworld is a, a wet place. And so he's coming out of the underworld. He's one of the most important creatures in Pueblo cosmology. The vast majority of petroglyphs on the Wells Petroglyph Preserve were done by the Pueblo people, but the Spanish arrived in 1598, and shortly after that date, images started appearing which represent the Spanish. The Christian cross would be by far the most common of those. I think something like 8% of all the images on the Mesa or on the Wells Petroglyph like Preserve are Christian crosses. And not just this, but very fancy things that, um, that represent uh, all kinds of Christian crosses in Europe that have names to them. I think there are 25 different named Christian cross types on the Mesa. We also have other figures, there are lots of horses and some Spanish lions. I think we've found about a dozen of them so far. 
and some of them are quite thrilling. And here's a good example of one. We can identify him because he has what appears to be a crown on his head. He has a long curving tail over his back, which is a, a diagnostic feature of a, a Spanish lion. And then he has a little companion here. They are, uh, we think, probably unique to this area. We don't know of any place else that they occur. But they are a very interesting manifestation of the presence of the Spanish. We think that they were probably done by the Indian people who were very much impressed by this lion image that the Spanish brought. They didn't, they have their own Pueblo lion images, but this was a different cat. And they recognized that and they recognized that this cat had a lot of power. And so they, we think, uh, perhaps re reproduced those. Because these are at least somewhat inspired by uh, Spanish heraldry, we can apply some heraldic terms. Notice that the lion on the right is sort of rearing up with the front legs in the air. This is called the rampant position. And a couple, but not all, of the heraldic lions on the preserve and on the mesa are rampant. This combination of the two figures together seems to always be executed with one figure packed more solidly and deeply than the other. So we have one or two other examples of a, a similar scene of a heraldic, a rampant heraldic lion with another creature. As you know, Catherine notes, it's wearing the crown. It has the long curving tail. And then also the face is facing forward and rendered almost like a human face. This is very distinctive from, say, how mountain lions would be rendered, because by convention, mountain lions, canids like coyotes and foxes, would be rendered from the side with their heads in profile. So this is another cue that tells us, yeah, it's a quadruped, but it's different from other things that they might see around we can also begin to just quietly speculate on some of the social interactions that led to this adoption of uh, Spanish heraldry into an indigenous society. And it reminds us of some of these social interactions that happened, sometimes friendly, sometimes tense, over the course of centuries that create a sort of complex story of how this design from medieval Spain gets here. So the mesa as a geologic feature is what we call an inverted landscape. The top of the mesa today was actually more or less the bottom of a river valley millions of years ago. And what's happened as the Rio Grande rift zone has been widening, first sediments have been coming down from the Sangre de Cristos and filling in this widening and deepening valley. So there's several kilometers of uh, old river deposits and lake beds just layered one on top of the other. Somewhere in there we have the eruption of the Valles Caldera and the volcanoes which preceded it, which have left a number of beds of tuff, uh, including the thickest bed from the eruption of the caldera itself. More river cobbles cap that, and then on top of all of this, there is a 3.4 million year old lava flow of basalt. It's only about 50% silica, which allows it to flow for long distances. And this basalt has flowed for about 15 to 20 miles. This basalt is much harder than all of those looser erosional sediments below it. So the hardest rock is on top. Now, because basalt is low in silica and thus low in viscosity, the areas that it capped 
were the absolute bottom of a river valley at the time. This has made the hardest surface at what used to be more or less the bottom of a river course, forcing rivers to go on either side of it. Over the last about 440,000 years, the Rio Grande has started cutting through the basalt plateaus, creating mesas like Mesa Prieta. Just to the north, we have another small mesa called La Masita that was also a part of Mesa Prieta until the river meandered and cut it off. That means that with the hard stone on top not eroding and most of the erosion happening as the river undercuts that, it creates these landslide features that are called Tariva blocks. This is a term that comes from Southwest geology and it's essentially when you take a flat landscape undercut and you get a landslide that just kind of goes out like that. The whole top slumps, a small surface fault forms and you get a widening that creates these shelves that are very characteristic of the landscape that we have here at Mesa Prieta. These are actually what create great agricultural features and also expose large flat surfaces of basalt to create the substrate that we find the petroglyphs on today. So what we've got here is a very subtle but important agricultural feature. You see, the slopes of Mesa Prieta form natural benches or terraces, and these are suitable for growing crops, catching rainwater, pooling it, and growing crops in an otherwise fairly arid landscape. One of the uh, technologies that Pueblos would use is what we call the grid garden. This leaves behind these very low walls, often in a rectangular shape, that looks like a grid or a waffle pattern. This entire area here was probably used for growing crops, certainly maize, possibly the Three Sisters, and other crops as well. And we still have evidence of that on the surface as features and as remnants of the plants themselves. So what we've got here is some of the evidence of the farming that occurred here. This is a heritage strain of maize, and the cobs actually seem to preserve very well in these arid environments. We do see these fairly frequently in areas where we have agricultural features like grid gardens and check dams and it's just one more piece of the puzzle that tells us about how significant this place was and how it wasn't just a place for visual expression but a place that was an integral part of and supported the lives of the Pueblo peoples who still live in the valley below today. During the Depression era, the uh, economic recovery was known as the Works Progress Administration, or WPA. This was a part of the New Deal and tried to stimulate the U.S. economy back from the brink of utter devastation by engaging in infrastructure projects. We know WPA was out here in 1938 because of JVJ, who's uh, one of our most prolific initial writers here on the Wells Preserve. We say, see JVJ around quite a bit, which makes you wonder 
how much time he or she was actually spending with the WPA versus how much time JPJ was wandering off. But this actually ties this place to a very significant moment in U.S. history, one that shaped the way that the, the River Valley is today. It also marks some of the uh, first presence of English speakers in this rural area. This is also a significant moment in the historical processes that have happened here, both physically on the landscape, but also culturally in the interaction of indigenous, Spanish-speaking, and English-speaking peoples who have now become a fairly diverse community living side by side. There's other historical evidence around here too. We don't know if this comes from JVJ or not, but it would not be surprising to find cans like this associated with uh, WPA workers camps. This cluster of boulders is amazing for a number of reasons, which have made it a very popular stop. Not only do all of these boulders originate from the same parent boulder, but together they work to tell the story of Mesa Prieta and the peoples who have visited here and called it home for nearly the entire time span that people have been in New Mexico. Many of these petroglyphs are so old that they have developed a patina uh, which is this recoloring of the rock surface, a full patina back to the original color of the rock surface, a process which takes thousands of years. Others are much newer, such as this example right down here, which show up much more brightly. Over on the far end, we see a sort of grid or net pattern. And these complex, intricate, but very abstract geometric forms are very characteristic of what we call the Desert Archaic Tradition. The Desert Archaic Tradition was a wide-spanning tradition of creating petroglyphs, much as we see here, across what is now the Western United States. Because of this long time span, we have archaic images that have that full patina and others which have not fully developed it. The lighting is absolutely perfect on this one right now, and it doesn't last very long before this one disappears back into shadow. And this is what I'm talking about when I say a fully developed patina, or since this is on a basalt substrate, basalt develops a specific type of patina called a desert varnish. So we could also say that this is fully revarnished. So we believe that this image comes from what we call the early archaic, which could be as old as 9,500 years. That said, we still don't really have a good understanding of the period before that, what's called the Paleo-Indian period, and what sort of petroglyphs they made here in New Mexico. In other places where we later on see the desert archaic tradition, we see similar geometric patterns to what we see in the early archaic here. We do know that people from the Paleo-Indian period were around here, as we've found what are called fluted points or fulsome points on Mesa Prieta. Now these are actually named for the town of Folsom in New Mexico. So we have evidence that some of the earliest peoples in New Mexico were here at Mesa Prieta. This one on top is fully revarnished, and we can be certain that this is from the Archaic period. Because this face faces up, it's more exposed to the weather. 
And so this may have fully revarnished or fully repatinated a bit more quickly than the one down below. Well, the patina makes it look of uh, roughly the same age of the other fully repatinated petroglyph. The design is more typical of the middle to late archaic, with the late archaic being uh, 1500 BC to 600 AD. We have another panel just below it in shadow that is difficult to see. And so we're not exactly sure how many of these archaic period petroglyph panels are here at the Wells Preserve and on Mesa Prieta. And over time, as has happened here, we get a lovely colorful lichen colony that unfortunately encroaches into the petroglyphs and sometimes can even eat away at the rock patina uh, or even at the texture of the rock, which can reduce the visibility of petroglyphs or for things as old as the archaic period that are thousands of years old, over thousands of years, that lichen could even completely obliterate the petroglyphs. This cluster of boulders and the panels all among them work together to tell a very long story that's at least as old as the beginning of that early archaic 9,500 years ago, and at so long that it extends through the classic Pueblo period, which ended in 1598 when Oñate made contact with the Pueblos that we know today as Santa Clara and Okeowinge. We have a number of archaic, early archaic panels, as well as middle archaic, which haven't necessarily fully redeveloped their patinas, and late archaic. Even over here, we have a mixture of early to middle and late archaic, over which is superimposed a classic Pueblo image of a figure with outstretched arms, an arrow, or possibly a spear or atlatl balanced on top of their head. Together, these tell a story thousands of years in the making. Even the boulders themselves, as I was pointing out, the desert varnish turns very black, but these exposed surfaces where the boulder has broken apart have not had enough time to fully darken, to fully revarnish. And so the splitting of the parent boulder into the ones that you see today happened sometime in between the first petroglyph panels made on this cluster and the last ones. Now this striking creature, we believe, is from the classic Pueblo period. In fact, we believe most or all of our flute player images here at the Wells Preserve are from the Pueblo classic period, which began about AD 1300, maybe 1350, and then continued through the time of contact. Of course, the figure is holding a flute, and that's the most obvious feature. And we do believe that this general area is uh, very acoustically significant, that there are echoes that have very interesting effects, and that might be a part of why people were using the space, including, but not limited to, making petroglyphs here. We also have an interesting instance of visual punning. If you look at the shape of the body of the flute player, and then this uh, possible bird figure above it may have a quail topknot 
and you'll notice that the bird figure kind of mimics the shape of the flute player. But there's something even more interesting going on because see the shadow coming down from above the flute player. Well, at the equinox, twice a year, that shadow will take the shape of the breaks in the rock above it, which will create a curve and then a straight line. And it will, right around midday, line up perfectly with the arc of the tail and the edge of the back. So we believe this to be an equinox marker. And it is noteworthy that the Pueblos that are here today uh, are known to have in the past celebrated the equinox, which is not always the case for all Pueblos. So this is a very special rock. And then we have others, for example, we have several that we know of, and I'm sure there are more that we don't know of, images that are um, either uh, solstice or equinox markers. For example, we have a fabulous winter solstice marker that is a big spiral. And on the 21st of December at dawn, there's a little bump on the rock that makes a point of light go right to the center of that spiral. And watch it happen makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It's the most exciting thing. Now, we're in a place that we call Flute Player Hollow, which has earned its name, but even within Flute Player Hollow, we're in a rather special room. To begin with, right in front of me, it's a very unique shield bearer. We call it a shield bearer because we have the shield design and then indications of the person who is carrying it. The arms simply aren't rendered, but we do see the legs and the head. But what makes this one unique is the design on the shield itself. This is the only place on the Mesa where we see this particular design. So it's very distinctive. And we believe that shield designs, much as you might see in dances today, could be very individual expressions. So the intricate panel in front of you is a great example of what we call superimposition or you might have heard the term palimpsests. When we say superimposition or palimpsests, we simply mean the layering of images one on top of the other on top of the other. And we have a lot of that going on here. One of the scenes that is clear, however, contains a human figure wearing a bighorn sheep headdress. We believe this to be some kind of dancer, and this person may have been rendered in a uh, scene of a procession as one of the layers in that palimpsest. Now I'm going to direct your attention over to here. We've got a shield design with a horizontal line dividing it, giving it kind of a ladybug shape. And next to that is a flute player. This isn't the only flute player in this room. There's another one directly behind me. Flute Player Hollow actually earns its name quite well. There are several in a rather small area, but this room in particular, these flute players indicate something special about this space. My voice is actually reverberating right now. This is a reverberating space. So if someone's to come in here with a musical instrument or to sing, to perform any kind of music, it's going to reverberate and potentially resonate with particular tones arising out of those echoes, like an accompaniment coming out of the rock.
one of the most exciting categories here is we have lots and lots of flute players, but we also have more than any place else we know of animals playing flutes. And some were the most charming things you ever saw. And we have no idea why there are so many of them here, but we're glad they are, we love them. And we have different kinds of animals playing flutes. There are some that look like humans, except they have tails. And so we count them as animals. We have four or five that are quadrupeds. They have four legs playing flutes. And then we have some that are shaped like insects that we call ant-bodied flute players. Weirdest one of all, the most wonderful one of all in many ways, is we have one that looks like an armadillo playing a flute. And he's a very rare, very rare and wonderful creature. And he, his, he has little round feet and he's just piping away and we love it and we have no idea why he's there, but there he is. So behind me is a panel from the Archaic period, and we believe these to be from the early Archaic, based on the amount of repatination and the style in which they're rendered. These abstract designs can be explained by a couple of different theoretical models. One of the Leading theories is what we call the neuropsychology model. The neuropsychology model simply states that these abstract designs are attempts at representing a person's own experiences when they're in, say, an altered state, such as in a trance or having a religious experience. Within those, there are what we call entoptic forms, which simply means images derived from the eye or behind the eye. And then there's a specific type of entoptic form called a phosphine, sort of flashes. You can experience phosphines yourself by simply lightly pressing on your eyes, waiting a moment, and then you begin to see patterns. Other types of phosphines include flashes and fractal patterns. And that's kind of what we see largely in the desert archaic tradition. So one of the leading theories is that people are representing some aspect of their religious experiences in these. This is only one theoretical model for explaining these. When we get to the late archaic, we start to see the incorporation of some of these designs into what we call figurative or iconic images, footprints, sheep people. When we look at the late archaic, and in neighboring regions, we see some of these designs incorporated into the bodies of human figures or into the bodies of bighorn sheep. We have an important clue that this model, this theory that we call the neuropsychology model, is probably consistent because it shows the transition from the initial religious experience and the representations of that through people making meaning out of that and placing it into their own worlds, into things that they can recognize, and gives us a transition thus from the archaic to the cultures that came afterwards, such as the ancestral Pueblo.
This panel, very interesting. We have some fertility imagery here in the form of a flute player. Now, why would a flute player be a fertility image? Well, when they're human figures, they invariably have this sort of pack or basket, what we call the fertility hump on the back. Sometimes this even curves right into the shape of their back. Also, and this is a fairly well-endowed male figure, and this is another thing that we see among the human flute players. Most, but not quite all, are very clearly men. Next to the flute player, we have a fainter image of a bird with outspread wings, with the feathers pointing down in sort of a rake shape. There are many various uh, theoretical explanations and names for this. Some will call it a thunderbird. However, thunderbird is not a local mythological feature. So while not impossible, it might not be. If you can pick up the crow calling, <laughs> the crow's probably saying, it's one of me. Earlier, we saw some turkey vultures, AKA buzzards, flying overhead. And that might be what we see here. Similar designs like this found in uh, Eastern California have been uh, described as condors. And we know that condor range today can reach at least as far as Utah. So in centuries past, it's not unreasonable to think that a condor might have been spotted as well. So while there is some ambiguity to this bird form and uh, various theoretical descriptions of it, all of these can be sort of explored together and then brought into context of both where we are and its position next to the flute player to sort of winnow down to the more likely scenarios. So I just shared a much fainter version of a very similar motif, a bird with outstretched wings, raked feathers. We may have that going on here. However, based on the, the beak shape, the direction that it is facing, and the tail feathers, this could also be a uh, depiction of a raptor or a parrot. Now, both macaws, a type of parrot, and raptors, including hawks and eagles, were raised and used by pueblos. Okeawenge certainly had macaws. We know this for sure. We also, further up on the mesa, have features where they would catch raptors, pluck their feathers, and then release them. In fact, the going was so good for catching and releasing raptors at Mesa Prieta that the Tewa of Okeawinge and Santa Clara said that they did not have to raise them. This is not necessarily true for some of our neighbors, such as uh, the Tewa of Picaris, Taos, and Pot Creek. But we definitely know that they also used raptor feathers, but did not use macaw feathers. So if this is a macaw, it would be an expression of Tewa identity, or if it's a raptor, it can be an expression of religious ceremonies around the feathers. Usually, pubescent boys are the ones who are sent out to catch them, the act of catching them, or the uh, social and economic ties with the Tiwa, with whom they shared the symbolic significance of raptors. The present-day Pueblo of Okeawinge, uh, as well as the currently depopulated Pueblo of Fiogi. And then uh, a little bit farther up, there was the uh, Pueblo of Saishu. Uh, we believe that uh, Saishu and Fiogi were Tewa. We know that um, Fiogi was Tewa because it was depopulated in 1690 after the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, but before the return of Spanish rule in 1692. At the time, uh, and, and there's actually a great talk that we sponsored last year through the Mesa Talk series by a uh, Tewa from, a Tewa elder from Okeawinge, who talks in more detail about this story. This image is, in fact, 
evocative of the stories of the Pueblo Revolt, which immediately preceded the 1690 movement of Tewa from Fiogi Pueblo to First Mesa in Hopi. In 1680, Pope, a Tewa Pueblo native uh, from Okeowinge, organized uh, resistance to Spanish occupation that involved most of the Pueblos in the, in the region. And how they were able to coordinate this so that they all rose up at the same time, essentially initiating a surprise attack, was through a uh, braided cord of yucca in which knots were tied, one for each day. As runners distributed these cords around to the villages, one knot was untied each day, so they could all rise up at once. We can't say for sure if this image is actually directly related to the Pueblo Revolt. However, we do have a figure with uh, an ornamental headdress holding what appears to be a knotted cord or beaded cord. It might be the same type of object that we hear emphasized in the oral traditions of the Pueblo Revolt. Our modern day trail follows a pre-contact trail. And how do we know that this is a trail and not just a bunch of glyphs? Because keep an eye out for turkey tracks, such as the one right there. And so what we've got is what I call a multi-panel composition. A panel is just a facing on a rock, which it, uh, and a composition, of course, is an arrangement of multiple petroglyphs. So multi-panel, multiple faces, with an arrangement of turkey tracks proceeding up this shallow gully, indicating a trail and all functioning together as one. We've also got a very intricate pecked into relief shield right here. And I'd be remiss not to point it out because the lighting is just so superb right now. So the multi-panel composition of turkey tracks continues here, here, here. And up that way. And while there's some spectacular things over there, I want to show you some things over here. So this panel right here is quite spectacular, but it's actually best contextualized with the panel right behind it I'll show you in a moment. This is what we call a shield bearer. So this uh, intricately decorated circle is a shield. Uh, and you can tell that it's been retouched to add feet, a head, uh, a probable arm holding something pointed, and has uh, had some embellishments on the shield design as well. Most of these shields are fairly unique. So we believe that much like the ornamental shield in Pueblo dances today, that shields were very much a personal expression. However, this very distinctive design and very close variations on it appear pretty consistently on the Wells Preserve uh, in a way that seems to, to suggest that this is a recognizable figure, either a culture hero or another theory is that the shield design represents the, the place. Over here is an implement that we can call a uh, stone axe or in Tewa, a kui. So this is a part of the martial imagery over here. In fact, if you look very closely, the pointed object was actually a kui that was um, shaped almost like a bow tie and then the sides were finished off to create a point at some point later on. This is another example of our Spanish heraldic lions. This one's a bit atypical in the fact that it has a rectangular Pueblo style body and a straight tail rather than a curving tail with a 
curving or arched body. Nonetheless, we can tell it's a lion. The forward facing, very human face, the mane, and the digitate toes. They don't draw mountain lions with digitate toes. One of the more interesting aspects of this, and I don't know if your microphone's gonna pick it up, but as I've turned to face the panel, I can definitely audibly hear the difference because this curved parabolic surface is reflecting my voice. We call these speaking stones, and there are several of these on the preserve and on the broader mesa. If you were to shout at this panel, at the lion, make a sound, if you were to roar at it like a lion, your sound will be projected out onto this wide landscape, onto the bosque, very loudly as if you're speaking through a megaphone. Now over to my right is the shield bearer that I was just showing off. And so from my VR approaches, we can actually illustrate the relationship that this lion, speaking lion, has with the shield bearer in that the observer of the shield bearer, someone in front of it, will actually, the shield bearer shields them from the very sonorous lion. Like everything, the mesa and the petroglyphs need love and care. Giving them that and doing the things that will provide for their protection and preservation is a lot of work. In my early days here, I um, spent a lot of time and energy fighting mining efforts in the area, and in some cases where there were petroglyphs. And to me, that was appalling, and it, it took a lot of people in order to um, make that kind of thing stop happening. But there also is um, Mother Nature and the problem of erosion, which is actually the biggest problem that we have. And it's the hardest kind of problem to solve. Basically, it takes a lot of money to have the machines and the engineering skill and the human power and so forth that it takes to deal with uh, erosion. We don't have that kind of money, even so it's a, uh, it can be a very expensive problem. My partner and I came here in 1992. I had no idea how many petroglyphs there might be or what they might be. I just knew that there were some, uh, which was pretty vague. Over the next year or two, I learned that there are so many that it's impossible for one person to try to do anything uh, toward their protection. My partner died in 2001, and so I started thinking about my own mortality and the fact that um, I probably needed to make a decision before too long about what was going to happen to them. So I, I did some research about different um, uh, conservation organizations, talked to different people about them, and I eventually decided that it would probably be the best thing if I would donate the land to the Archaeological Conservancy, which is an important um, conservation organization in New Mexico, as well as the rest of the country. I eventually had talks with Jim Walker and found out all the information I need, needed to know about how this happens and what to do. And so I eventually decided that I would give the land and the petroglyphs to the Archaeological Conservancy. Our main long-term goal is trying to preserve these petroglyphs. It's an amazing cultural and historic site. And I like to say everybody's history is on the rocks. And even mine, there are some 
angle of petroglyphs out there. But it's a very important site to preserve for the future. Thank you.